Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sasha Archibald, and I'm going to give the first part of this presentation, and then my colleague, Matthew Fitzjohn, will give the second part. We're going to be talking about a site in northern Greece, in the Halkidic Peninsula, which represents a combination of older and new projects. And the first question we might be tempted to ask is why Olympus? It isn't a name that may be at all familiar to me. Olympus was already known to 18th and 19th century scholars because if they had read their classical texts, they knew that Xenophon, the pupil of Socrates, historian and philosopher, had talked about it as the biggest city in the Thracian area. It also formed the subject of a series of important speeches by the great 4th century orator Demosthenes, whose portrait statue you see on this slide in Copenhagen. So the name Olympus was well known to classical scholars, but it was the most unknown of the big ancient cities of Greece. Its location was unknown and its remains were unknown. So it formed an interesting topic worthy of discovery in the early years of the 20th century. More recently, in the great compilation of ancient sites that is illustrated on this slide, edited by Moens Hansen and Thomas Heiner Nielsen, an inventory of archaic and classical polis. Olympus, number 588 in this compilation, is described as one of the top city sites in ancient Greece, along with Athens, Syracuse, Sparta, Pantacapion, and a very few more. So it is really in that top league of ancient sites, but not many that you may have heard of before. So a few words now about the discovery of Olympus and what it means on the ground. The site of ancient Olympus was identified in the early 1900s, but it was excavated by an American classical scholar, David Moore Robinson. He was a professor of classics at Johns Hopkins University. And he was looking for an exciting big site to investigate and to publish. He was looking for temples, he was looking for great monuments. Unfortunately, he didn't find temples and great monuments. He found houses. His project was an exemplary one in terms of the speed with which it was published. A total of 14 volumes between 1928 and 1952. So in many ways Olympus was a model of how to publish the results of a big project. The methodology of the project was somewhat controversial at the time. Nevertheless, Olympus represents an enormous legacy to archaeologists generally, and to classical archaeologists in particular. And this is one of the reasons why a new project was initiated in 2014 as a collaboration between the Greek Archaeological Service and the Universities of Michigan and Liverpool under the auspices of the British School at Athens. And what we have tried to do in the six years is to take forward the investigations 
of Robinson's day and use the most up-to-date techniques in delivering new data. In terms of the older investigations, Olympus was a pioneering project in many ways, both in terms of spatial investigation and in terms of specific excavation. The discovery of Olympus is not uh, the uh, reward of David Moore Robinson, but rather of Alan Wace, whose photo you see on the right. Alan Wace was involved in investigations in northern Greece in the years before the First World War, and it was he who identified the two hills as being the likeliest location of ancient Olympus, and he published some notes to this effect in 1916. But subsequently, Wace became involved in the international allied project that was the First World War and the defense of Greece against northern states. Alan Wace himself was spirited away to Athens, where he was responsible for what may be the first example of an international passport. On the left, we see Alan Wace with some of his contemporaries who were among the pioneering scholars of many of the sites in central Greece, including Mycenae, Corinth, Koraku, sites of different periods and with very different results. The team that David Moore Robinson put together was uh, a team of young scholars. We have uh, Robinson there in plus fours on the right hand side of the slide with his Greek uh, overseers and uh, um, assistants, including the publishing ladies, as well as his graduate students, uh, who take up the uh, middle steps of the image. Many of those graduate students went on to become leading archaeologists in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. I mentioned that Robinson did not discover the great monuments that he was anticipating. He began work on the southern of the two hills, which we have found is in fact an extremely complicated environment to work in. On the left, we can see a slide of his trenches on the northern side of the south hill, showing what looks like foundations of a large monument. This is still rather serious. It's been given lots of names. It's been suggested that this is a public building. Robinson was expected to find a temple, and on the right there, you can see some examples of small columns and altars that were discovered in this area, but found to be unconnected to any major ritual or cult world. So looking now at these two hills that you see on the slide, on the, on the middle of the slide here, the North Hill and the South Hill. This is the South Hill, this is where Robinson began his investigations, and the location of that slide was approximately here. Most of the information that Robinson discovered about the city of Olympus relates to houses, houses that entirely occupied the North Hill and the South Hill. The other major discovery of Robinson's day were the cemeteries, which are located here on the northwest side. Because Robinson failed to discover any major monuments, he was more or less obliged to treat the residential features that he recovered as a virtue. And he did present an extraordinary story about domestic living. More than 50 houses were at least partially, if not fully, excavated. And you can see here on the right an aerial view of the conserved area, which shows you these houses today if you visit 
um, as, a, a, as a member of the public. The houses were organized in Insuli with two broader avenues, one on the left side and one on the right side, reconstructed here on, on uh, the left of this slide. And one of the aims of the new project was to investigate individual house units to try and find out what the new kind of evidence is that we can discover using contemporary scientific methods as compared with the broad brush evidence that we have from a very large number of houses from Robinson's excavations. So the new techniques that we're using include uh, digital GPS, photogrammetry, uh, soil chemistry, drone photography, flotation organic samples, microstratigraphy, X-ray analysis of minerals, and of course laboratory analysis of various materials, fired clay, unfired clay, charcoal minerals, formal plant remains, in addition to the uh, single context excavation of individual house units. There is a broader investigation here, uh, and I'm particularly interested in the economic background of the city of Olympus. Olympus was a big city not just because it was heavily populated, because it had investment from the Macedonian king. It had access to some of the best timber in the region. And this is reflected in coins that are found on the site. And the digits that are represented on this slide show you the numbers of coins and their places of origin. There is a very large concentration of coins, local coins coined in the region of Olympus in its vicinity. But there are many coins from locations round and about the area, and I haven't included here the very large number that come from sites much further afield, including the southern gym. The volumes of Robinson's publication on coins are some of the most valuable that we have, the most valuable evidence that we have from Robinson's death, because this is information that is largely been covered it will no longer be possible to recover the sorts of numbers of coins that were discovered in the 1930s. Coming now to the variety of data sets that we dispose of as a result of this project. Geophysical data has provided us with a great deal of information about the distribution of houses and the relationship between the residential areas and non-residential areas. Just selecting for you here the resistivity data. Uh, here is the house on North Hill outlined in red, which we have selected for complete excavation. You can see that it is not far away from the conservation area that I showed you in that aerial photo a few moments ago. And we can see from the resistivity data that the broad outline of the street system continues here. And this is what Robinson and his team surmised when they excavated long slip trenches in other parts of the hill, like this one over here going in the northward direction. Nevertheless, there are other areas that do not conform to that pattern, and we can see these most clearly on the northeast side of the North Hill, where there is a break in this system of organisation, and we have all sorts of other ways of patterning the data. And this is where we suspect there is non-residential activity, uh, but that's not the subject of today's presentation. In terms of housing, we have investigated a single house unit, uh, which in uh, Robinson's terminology is related to uh, area B, um, insular 9, number 6, and this is an aerial view using photogrammetry 
to show you the outline of the house. It's not the most recent plan, because that one has not yet been presented to the Greek Archaeological Service, so we're not, we're not allowed yet to show you the most recent completed version. But I think you get some idea about the outline, the part of the wall the west here, um, and a little stone passage between this house and the neighbouring one in the north, uh, and a shared wall here with the neighbouring house in the east. And on the south side, we have the road system uh, continuing west east. So this is one house that we've investigated, and we have investigated a number of other trenches on the south hill, where we have stratigraphy from the early Iron Age onwards, right down to the middle of the fourth century when the site was destroyed by the Macedonian King Philip II in 348 BC. So we will be able to compare the kinds of houses that preceded what we see on the right here once we have completed our examination of the trench data that you see from the left. Various different kinds of data sets have been accumulated which provide us with additional information. The intensive survey has been conducted on the two hills and in a seven kilometre area around the site. Uh, and the data drawn from the survey is providing us with a lot of additional information about the kinds of materials that appear here and therefore the distribution of concentrated house units uh, in the uh, fields adjacent to the hills, which represent the urban area in its broader understanding, not just the fortified hilltops, but the slopes as well, and some locations out in the fields here. There is, of course, the broad rural territory which I'm not saying anything about on this occasion. If we look at other types of data, we can see more clearly the sort of evidence that we're going to be able to use profitably from the South Hill, where we have a palimpsest of older and later construction. One of the interesting things about the South Hill is that we have a rather different orientation of house units and streets. And this is particularly interesting if we think about what we know of civic organisation in Europe more broadly, whether we're thinking about France or Germany or Austria or other parts of Southern Europe. This represents a very interesting pulverandum to begin with, we do not have a regular grid sort of pattern. There is some evidence of partial north-south roads and these interesting west-east streets which are discontinuous and curved. We don't altogether know why they're curved, but they are curved. And there are units of houses that are not like in the city, there are collections of house units. And the precise organisation of house units is something that we're working on quite intensively at the moment. So we have resistivity data, we have um, uh, other types of uh, geophysical data, electrical data here, and ground penetrating radar. So looked at in more detail, we can see these units representing complex combinations of individual house cells. And it's going to take a little while to extricate what the individual house units are from the period preceding the one that we're mainly focusing on in this project. And I'm now going to hand over to Matthew Christon, who's going to say a bit more about the work that is being funded by the Society of Antiquities. So, um, I would 
So I'm going to talk about the, the research that the Society of Antiquities is, is funding, but I, I have to go back one, one stage first. Um, provide a little bit of context to, uh, to this research. So Zosh has talked about the project as a whole. I'm going to focus on the household and on the house. And the first thing I should say is the, the work we're doing fits into much larger discussions about the ancient economy. Um, now typically, for classical archaeology, the emphasis on, is on representations and trying to understand agriculture and broader trade or pottery production. Um, we're really interested in the domestic economy, but a, a very particular part of that. So, slide is slightly in the wrong order, but we have here a, from uh, the OSHA a, a representation of the types of activities, um, bread making or weaving, that people traditionally study and talk about in terms of the domestic economy um, or, or grain. Um, grinding grain and, and, and food production. We're looking at a broader range of activities at the site. Um, now, Alinthos has already um, had a lot of work due to the, the wealth of the publications that Robinson published. There have been a lot of publications, journal articles and also um, monographs Lisa Nevitt, who's one of the current co-directors, um, published a book in a version of her thesis um, in 1999, which has been really influential in, in classical archaeology. And a large part of this focused on material at Olympus. And she was focusing on the domestic economy. And, and also, there's another volume, you can't see that very well, it's a terrible photograph, but this is a work by an American classical archaeologist, Nicholas Cahill. And both Lisa Nevitt and Nicholas Cahill have focused on weaving, uh, food production, and other ac economic activities that were happening within the house. And one of the things that both of these scholars have done is use Robinson's original publications to look at the distributions and concentrations of material within the house, to write a story about domestic production and differences in the domestic economy across the city. All well and good. But I think there's a lot more you can say beyond the artefacts that are in the houses. So I wanted to start with a um, famous quotation from, from Xenophon. Um, who is describing the value of construction and the materials and what they can be used to produce. And in the context of this, traditionally in classical archaeology, people have been interested in construction, but they've tended to focus on the construction of temples and stoas and evaluate the implications of these buildings. Um, but I'm, I, our work is returning to the, the words of Xenophon and also accounts by Vitruvius about the, the technologies and the financial costs of building domestic structures to think about the nature of construction, who was involved in construction, the cost of it and the, the role of the creation of houses in the domestic economy. Um, and this includes... I'll come on to this a little bit more detail in a while. But traditionally, in the question of who was involved in construction, um, we write stories about all the men who were involved in construction. Um, but I guess my punchline is construction is much more complicated, in, uh, required huge resource, both physically and in terms of people time. And the likelihood is a much wider range of people would have been involved in construction. And that's coming from the Olympus evidence that, that more than likely children, women, other people involved, and the types of activities they're doing will probably never tie down. But 
within vernacular construction around the world, women are often involved, you will find them, but they tend not to be written about, and that's typical of the classical sources as well. So, how might we get to who's involved? And this is the big question. And also, what was the cost of construction? So, to start off with, before we get to the house we've been excavating, I say we. I haven't been excavating. Other people have been excavating and I have been doing things back in Liverpool, which is not as glamorous, but I've been involved in more of the interpretation. So, to start off with as a, as a context for this, um, within the original publications by Robinson, there's quite a lot of detail about construction itself, but it focuses on, on a limited range of evidence. So there are there's documentation on different styles of walls, and I should say that these structures are not stone built. They would have a stone foundation for the wall, and then they are mud brick buildings um, with incorporating timber and also with tiled roofs. Um, and there's something about the wall. So uh, Zolsha was talking about the structures and the little red block is put up just to focus attention because the assumption is that these blocks of houses were built by uh, moving from west to east across the blocks. So the houses shared party walls. So it's like a, a row of terraced houses that you start on this side and then you are building fewer walls here um, in the houses next, next to each other. And also that the roof system is shared across the house. So when you find a stair base in a house, you assume everyone had a, a second story to the house itself. So, um, aside from some details about different types of wall construction, most interpretation of construction has, has tended to focus on the idea that because there was variation in the walls that you see dotted around the city, probably families were involved in construction. Um, but at the same time, we know that this northern part of the city, um, the development of it uh, was influenced by the Macedonian king, uh, Perdiccas uh, II. And so there are unknown answers about who funded and how construction was organised. But the general narrative has been that it was probably families involved in construction. Um, whoops, I put one thing there. How do I get back? I have to go out there. Um, so, should have come up earlier. This is a, the, we have very few representations of mud brick from all of Robinson's publications. So the, the stone foundations were interesting, but the mud bricks they found weren't really recorded. There are some details of the mud bricks, and it's what I'm going to focus on um, now in terms of what we know about the structures. So, um, a few numbers here to get to a key point. Typically, the average house had a required just over 15 uh, cubic metres of rubble foundations. Um, and, and so what's the cost of doing that and, and creating these rubble foundations? Well, depending on the tools, perhaps something between 22 and 63 person hours. Um, I should say that the pH is for person hours, but it's a, it's a, this is a way to try to calculate the cost of the construction. How have I calculated that? Well, helpfully, um, there are some ethno-archaeological studies in Central America and in Turkey and in Greece that have taken poor 
I, I say poor, not financially, but in terms of they dragged farmers out who are involved in construction and asked them to dig and to quarry and to make mud bricks. And so they've taken an, I've taken an average time of this work to calculate the cost or the, in terms of person time of construction. Um, so the extraction of the rubble took somewhere around probably 50 hours or something like that. Um, to build the walls, around 100 person hours. Um, the mud bricks um, are of a variety of sizes. So this is one thing that's quite interesting about the, the record from the earlier excavations. There isn't one uniform size of mud brick. There appear to be different sizes used for throughout the building, each building. Uh, there's a relatively similar sizes, but it looks like you have a more complex type of um, production of mud bricks. Most houses, depending on the height of them, and this goes back to the stair base issue, most houses with one floor were probably around two metres high. And if they have a rubble foundation and mud bricks on top, probably required just over 12,000 mud bricks. If they're two storeys high, could be up to 53,000 mud bricks. And suddenly, I won't go through all these details slowly because it gets a little boring, but we're talking about hundreds of hours for both the excavation of the settlement, for the production of mud bricks, drying um, in ethnographic accounts and accounts from vernacular architecture, typically people leave mud bricks to dry for a few days to a week. If we were to follow the Trubius, we'd leave our mud bricks for two years to dry if you want really good mud bricks. Um, but that adds time and cost and turning them so there are cost implications for the, for the production and during the shrinkage and drying process. Um, now, uh, where are these mud bricks produced? Probably down in the river, not entirely sure where. Um, it might be that they are down here, a close proximity to the site, but people would have to navigate through the cemeteries if you're going to produce your mud bricks and then bring them back up to site. But the location is important, because what is interesting is that actually one of the most significant costs is bringing the mud bricks to site. Uh, thousands of hours, even if you use donkeys, there are thousands of hours. And obviously with a donkey, the benefit is you could have four donkeys and, and a child directing the donkeys up to the ridge. But you're still talking about a lot of time involved in transportation. Um, in terms of a house that's about two metres high, in terms of the foundations and the mud brick, we're probably talking about 2,800 hours. Now, obviously, if there are 2,800 people involved, it doesn't take very long. But we don't know how many people are involved. It's a significant amount of time. More significant, I think, is that, and this is just a calculation on a few hundred, we think the North Hill is built in a relatively short amount of time. We don't know how long but it, there was a, a coming together in the creation of this new community. For around 150 houses, and there may well have been more, you could be talking about hundreds of thousands of hours just for a two-story structure. But we know many of these houses are very elaborate and probably were, sorry, a one-story structure, but most were probably two stories high. At that point, we're talking about millions of person hours. So it's a very complicated process involving a lot of people and a lot of resource and logistical management. Okay, so I should say that's all based on foundations and the mud bricks. But there's clearly a lot more involved. But that's all we could do, really, with Robinson's publication. That's about the, you know, we can say there's a lot of time involved. The value of the Society of Antiquaries grant is that it's twofold. The first thing is it's supporting us to analyse 
mud bricks so we have a much clearer understanding of production, the types of sediment involved, the quantities of water, how much chaff might be needed for producing a mud brick. Um, we're also analysing slags and worked iron because, of course, all the doors, timbers needed nails and iron in them. Uh, one of my colleagues in Liverpool, uh, Dr. Charing um, Kabuchu, is looking at charcoal analysis to try and identify the different types of woods that may have been used for cooking, but also structurally in the architecture, where this wood is coming from. Is it local wood? What is the distance, perhaps? Or what types of wood are being used? Because there are impl implications here for seasoning the wood and the size of the timbers you can, you can uh, use. And um, Dr. Stalabras is, is uh, undertaking formal analysis as well, which is more about understanding the domestic economy on top of this. And, and so this is crucial because these original calculations of hundreds of thousands of hours for a city is just the walls. We know, and we're not doing this so much, but one of our students who's from uh, Aarhus University in Denmark is currently looking at mosaic production. Many of the houses have mosaics in them um, and uh, up have plastered walls. And so the different analyses that are uh, being supported by the Society of Antiquaries will feed into not only understanding what the houses may have looked like, what they might have, would have looked like, but also the cost implications for that construction and decoration of the structures. Um, this is one of the ori original um, drawings of what the houses may have looked like. Um, I should say that um, how we are trying to understand what the house looked like in terms of in the field and also analysing the plans. Aside from these uh, laboratory-based analyses, is we have a much more detailed understanding of the excavation. Robinson's publications, as wonderful as they are, typically there is half a page to a page on each house. So you don't understand how the life history of the house. So what the excavation is revealing and we're trying to understand now is the sequence of wall construction because at the moment the belief is that uh, we have in all of these houses they were built in a single moment where you would have built the, maybe the, uh, the external walls and the internal walls and your, your second story but the excavation um, we're looking at potentially much more complicated sequence to the structures. Um, if we look in this northern part in these rooms, the walls don't align particularly well. You might not see it so clearly here. And so one of the questions we're trying to answer is, were some of these internal walls added later? Was the construction process more complicated where people the city was occupied for over a hundred years and was there an earlier manifestation with external walls and some internal walls and then it became subdivided through time because that has interesting implications for how people live the house but it also has interesting implications for the eco economy and the economics behind house construction as well. And also the sequence of some of these internal uh, spaces down in the south as well. Um, And how this, I should go back up, how this courtyard may have been used and whether internal walls were added to divide out this space. So, <clears throat> what I do in Liverpool in my spare time, well, I, well I'm paid to do. Um, one of the things I do is I use 3D modelling to try and understand house construction and visualisation of, of houses. Um, these aren't the finished models, these were kind of some of my work in progress. Um, but I could go through what we th think the organisation of the house might be. So, um, at the moment there's some discussion about what this 
how this room may have functioned. But what we do know, what we're still trying to understand, is this back room, which is one of the spaces that is most often talked about in Olynthus, um, which is often referred to as a kitchen complex. And there are lots of problems with, those ter- with that term. Um, but we think that um, this is potentially an area where uh, food production took place. And this funny-shaped block I put here is the flu, um, and I should put some more models on, but potentially this may have been an area where braziers were put and uh, food was cooked uh, and the smoke was taken out of the house. But what's been quite frustrating for me when I use 3D modeling software is that the technology requires you to know what it is you want to build. It's not that you can play around with your structure, but it's time-consuming activity. And so to make lots of different models takes a lot of time and energy. Instead, if you use small plastic bricks, it's a little easier to think through some of the construction scenarios. Um, And this is... um, just a couple of snapshots of when I was playing and thinking about the house, of this issue about how these, the house may have, have been designed. Um, there's a stair base here, and I put on the previous slide, stairs going up. Now, of course, the stair base has been identified, but we don't know at this stage whether it was at the initial stage of the house or whether there was later development, they did their attic conversion and built up. Um, If there's a second story, you probably need this wall going across here. But it's interesting that they're not aligned all the way across. It's either not particularly good builders, or maybe um, it might be a secondary addition. Working with bricks is also useful to think about the logistics of of how you put your structure together. And it also helps you to think about the space of the structure as well. Many of the discussions that happen on site relate to the function of particular rooms. We find artefacts and then people try to interpret the function of the space. Is it a dining room? Is it a room for storage? What activities are taking place? Because as Osha mentioned, this, this city was destroyed and so there's a lot of debate about did people leave before the destruction? Did they take material with them? Were their houses robbed afterwards? What was burned? What was destroyed during the conquest? So you have a fragmented record, so it's not a perfect way to understand the house. So one of the other things I've been doing is thinking about the types of activities some of the specialists are identifying, is trying to populate and put activities back into the room. Um, and then the very useful thing is the second story, because there are lots of possibilities. In a way, it's easier to try and work out these lower spaces because we've got walls. We don't have anything for the second story other than the fact we've got a staircase. So do we imagine it's aligned in exactly the same way as the other rooms on the ground floor? And the big question is this area here. Do we have a completely covered upper story um, or do we have other options with flat roofs that may have been used um, or flat rooms with some kind of wall around them um, that could have been used for drying vegetables or drying clothes or whatever else you might use to drape across your roof um, in particular months of the year and how might these rooms have been used um, and so I've been using this as a, as, a, as a kind of iterative tool to think about that construction process. The other reason why it's been very useful, and this is not connected to the Society of Antiquaries funding, but it's funding connected, well, which was given to me by the, um, awarded to me by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, who I should thank for that grant, um, is that I've been taking the research at Olympus and our research in the houses into schools and trying to train teachers 
to be able to teach archaeology and to be able to make archaeology relevant to primary school and also secondary school children. Because ancient Greece is on the national curriculum for primary schools. It's a subject that can be taught along with British prehistory, Roman Britain. But it basically, the statement on the national curriculum is children should know about uh, uh, how we have benefited from the wonder of Greek society. So teachers often don't know anything about ancient Greece and they're not sure what to teach. And they find it difficult to engage children. And so this has been a wonderful way to teach about um, how people lived in the ancient world. Then also to teach art and design and maths and other subject matters, but to focus the activities on daily life and to get children to think about potentially similarities with the ancient world. So um, it's worked very well in some Sheffield schools where I've worked because the houses around the school are just like, well, not as grand as some of the empty ones, but they're terraced blocks of houses. So you can teach about Greek cities that had rows of terraced houses and take them outside and get them to reflect on similarities with their own, um, own life and also the differences. I switch back to you. Well, what we what we try to do is in, in uh, our presentation today is to give you a quick snapshot of what the research is in the project as a whole and what we have benefited from in terms of the society's funds to develop our own uh, particular topics of research that are going to take the fieldwork forward into the analytical stage and provide us with the materials to talk about the economies of housing and the economies of the city at large. Thank you very much for listening.